Where is it? So the beaver is either living in the bank or that might not be a thing at all. And it might be more of like a muskrat that's living in the bank right in this area. He actually just came out of there. Um, and it's right in the area of the backwater that the beaver is causing, that the water that he's backing up, the deeper area. So it's interesting, maybe the muskrat, if it is a muskrat, or whatever he or she is, is one of the many animals that benefits from the cascade of effects that beavers have in the landscape. So one of the things I wanted to point out, which is so interesting about this beaver dam. So beavers will actually dam up the whole main stem of the primary rivers here in Vermont and uh, probably in many other places too. And these are all blown out every winter because ice and spring, you know, when ice, when ice out happens, obviously there's massive multi-ton blocks of ice coming down this channel and it's going to take out, you know, even pretty large boulders, large trees oftentimes. So it easily takes out a beaver dam, but a lot of silt is caught through the work of the beaver here. And interestingly, so this was all like a perfect dam in terms of like it was very well maintained and it was really slowing up the water in a very even way until we just got a two inch rain event in like 12, 18 hours or so. And so this water's up a lot more than it was and it did kind of blow it out in sections. But um, what I find is really neat is he's building with rock. He's just using whatever he has. And one of those primary materials is um, Japanese knotweed because there's a lot of it around. In some places, it's kind of all there is. And, well, in no places is it all there is. That's classic invasive species fundamentalistic rhetoric that I've heard so many times. I'm even saying it. But in some places, it dominates for sure. And there's a lot less of the other species uh, in concert with it. In nowhere is it the only species, that's for sure. It's not like toxic to every other species. Um, and uh, so he builds with it. And you can see how he lays it down. They do that on a, on a lot of beaver dams. It seems like a very strong way to build. But there's chunks of root. And it's actually a, like a living knotweed fence. And uh, it looked more apparent that, that, uh, a week ago than it does now since the rain event. But you can see there's like full-on living knotweed in this uh, dam. And so that's incredibly robust if you can anchor the knotweed in. And there's a chance that that knotweed will actually survive uh, a dormant season. A, uh, you know, a whole winter and even maybe ice out. Now, maybe not, not the whole way, of course, but some of it. And it could start causing enough siltation and kind of change in the channel that um, the knotweed starts to really build up um, the knotweed berm that the beaver has made, living berm, starts to actually cause enough sedimentation in certain areas to raise the land and um, get above the water uh, enough of the time that the knotweed can survive, you know, multiple years and then keep accruing sediment and kind of kicking in a, a positive feedback loop of, of, of sedimentation and, and channel adjustment that um, there can be some semi-permanent, nothing's permanent in the floodplain here, but semi-permanent changes in kind of morphology of the flood of the uh, channel in ways that reduce erosion and back up water and create deeper pools and have a cascade of ecological effects largely benefits. Um, so it's really neat to see. And if he was only or she was only building with 
um, dead materials and not living plant matter, you know, the robustness and the durability of, of his or her creations would not be nearly as much, of course. But, but the fact that there's living plant material in here, knotweed, is, is incredible. Um, and it could, you know, could really start to be semi-permanent at the edge, you know, at the edges more than in the middle. But you can see, I mean, there's, there's semi-permanent plant communities right in here. Um, and uh, that, that's good. That's a good thing for the channel. I mean, the, the, the least um, ecologically beneficial channel is just a, a, um, a straight and very defined channelized um, path for the river where there's no meanders and there's no like little floodplain access ways to happen. Like that's like a micro floodplain right here where the river can just hop up into and all that rough vegetation then can grab onto sediment and slow the flow of the river and back up water here and there and sediment falls out in those rougher textured zones. And, uh, you know, you really, when it looks like this and it's just a clean channel, you have much more uh, of an erosive um, riverbed where things are, where, where all the material is just moved much faster. Erosive kind of entropic processes are, are much faster than when you, when you have a complex edge. Like this is a good example of a complexifying edge happening here into the channel. This is relatively simple because it's very um, a very clean edge. It's not very species dominant or species diverse. And um, then you have probably an even more erosive channel right here. Although there is an intentional induced scour that some river work created that that was intentionally made by people that causes an awesome swimming hole incidentally speaking of uh invasive plants you know we always hear this party line that they take over and uh, they exclude everything else and uh you can walk up and down thousands upon thousands of miles of river channel river corridor and see the same kind of thing there's a japanese knotweed there's a japanese knotweed there's a japanese knotweed here's one here there's one there there and there's a willow over there but otherwise do these knotweed really look like they're excluding every other species this is what would be here if the knotweed wasn't here look at this how much biological activity is happening here how much life value ecological benefit habitat is this worth right here you know. now it's it's the substrate for habitat but someone needs to be able to get a foothold that's what this guy's doing right here or gal or they so actually if you look at the species in this area and took a sample you find almost none, but there are a few on the downstream side of Mr. or Mrs. Knotweed here, or they Knotweed, or I don't know, whatever the prefix of the Knotweed pronoun, the latest pronoun might be. So here's a, um, oh, is this maiden something? I, I forget who this is. I, just, I heard the name recently, but I forget now. Um, and you got a few other plants getting a toehold in the organic matter that this knotweed has encouraged to happen. So here's organic matter. Here's the beginnings of the possibility of more life. And that's courtesy of the knotweed. 
And this is courtesy of no plant. So it's, you know, always got to question the fundamentalist dogmatic rhetoric because it's never black and white, especially with living systems. We let our, we kind of let our, our politics into ecology way too much and our, our mental habits, our binary mental habits, right? Um, it's interesting. Look, there's someone in the downstream of this too. Here's this knotweed. And look, someone is making a living immediately in the downstream side of, 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 of this plant. And it's a, um, a uh, bindweed of all. Trumpet vine, I guess sometimes people call it. I have it as a terrible weed in the garden. Um, and they're making a living in the organic matter that the knotweed has allowed to happen. So that's the beginning of, of the next ecosystem here. You have to start slowing the erosive forces and holding on to, uh, to some soil. And oftentimes it's the non-recently non native, because these are native here now, they're just as native as anyone else now. Um, but it's oftentimes the recent arrivals, the new immigrants that are able to do things that the people, both human people and plant people, um, who have been there for a long time, aren't able to do or aren't willing to do. When I used to live in the Bahamas, it was the Haitians, the newly arrived Haitians, the then the the new Baha new Bahamians, people who were from Haiti, um, who were willing to do a lot and able to do a lot that the Bahamians generally weren't, and um, they were hated by a lot of Bahamians for that. Um, but they were, you know, amazing. They are amazing people doing really important things and really playing really important functions in that socio eco social ecosystem in that ecosystem it's no different with with plant people and human people what a crystalline beautiful day <laughs>